This Week in the Boardroom, brought to you by Corporate Board Member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partner, the Center for Audit Quality, and contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals. Welcome to this edition of This Week in the Boardroom. I'm TK Kerstetter with Corporate Board Member, and it's a pleasure to have you back this week on what is going to be a very interesting show. Um, we have never discussed the topic of conflict of interest um, at the board level, and I have a resident expert with me um, who I've had the chance to work with for many years, and it's a pleasure to have her on the show. Please welcome Holly Gregory. Thank who's you, TK. A, partner in corporate governance with Weil Gutshaw Mangies. And uh, Holly, you have spent time in corporate governance for most of your career, so you've talked to a lot of boards. You had uh, these kind of issues crop up, so that's why I thought you'd be the most excellent person to join me as a guest. So the first thing that we need to do, Holly, is sort of give some little bit of definition, maybe even some examples around the concept of conflict of interest on the board level. Well, sure, and I start from the perspective that a director owes a really special duty to the corporation. You all know about the duty of loyalty. I know all of your listeners do. And what that means from a conflict perspective is that a director has to have an undivided loyalty when he or she is making decisions on behalf of the company. That means being really aware of where personal or business interests could impact the director's decision making. And so I define a conflict for a director's purpose is any kind of relationship, business or personal, that could influence decision making so that he or she may not make a decision that's really in the best interests of the company. So this could be anything from hiring a family member or somebody they're related to, to um, potentially accepting gifts or whatever, right? Yeah. I think the hiring of family members is a great example of something that could be potentially a conflict. And remember, conflicts are sort of natural parts of our lives, and it doesn't mean that we can always avoid them. Um, sometimes a conflict um, and a relationship is in the interests of a company going forward. So it's not the end of the analysis to define something as a conflict, but certainly it's the most important start of the analysis. So being aware of the kinds of issues that could give rise to conflict situations. A primary one is um, a business that's thinking about hiring a family member. Um, another one would be um, a business that's thinking of entering into a transaction with an entity with which the director is closely affiliated, either as a, also as a director or as an employee or as an owner. So those are the kinds of interests that, in situations that can give rise to conflicts, and the key is to identify them. There's another kind of conflict that is what's called uh, investment-related conflict, where um, a director, um, in most likely their personal or could be their business, is making investments in things that could also create a conflict. Explain that a little bit. Absolutely. If you would. So, if a director has an ownership interest in a company that's, um, that comes to compete with the company that he's serving as a director, or has an ownership interest in a large supplier um, to the company, that can give rise to conflicts. And again, um, while a lot of corporate policies say you should avoid conflicts, the first thing you have to do is identify them and disclose them. In the competitive situation, um, we don't often see really direct ownership interests by a director in a competitor in any significant way because there are antitrust laws that really prohibit that. But it's possible to own a business and over time for um, that business to go into a line of business that competes with the board that you're serving on. And it can be slow and subtle, and you have to keep your ears and eyes open for when that can happen. And particularly in today's time, because we're talking you know, a lot more transparency and optics. Mm -hmm. Optics becomes a big issue. Well, optics is a big issue, and another reason I focus on sort of that identifying conflicts, the, the most important thing around handling a conflict is identifying it 
and disclosing it, disclosing the business or personal interest to the general counsel, the board, so that they're aware of it, partly so that they can make sure that decisions that the board is taking aren't tainted by that conflict, but also because there are a lot of disclosure obligations that come about because of those relationships. And so when we talk about related person transactions, that's a very particular type of conflict that has to be disclosed or when we're talking about um, another area where it comes into being where you need that disclosure is the independence determinations that every New York Stock Exchange board has to do around the members of the board. Are they independent for purposes of stock exchange rules? Those things get, get, get impacted by conflicts of interest potentially and so the board needs to be aware of conflicts that directors have for that, for that reason as well. Let's talk about another angle of conflict, uh, which is sort of gifting, not only gifting out, but sort of gifting in. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it could be cash, could be entertainment. Um, that's another area that probably deserves some discussion relative to conflicts. Absolutely. That's a big issue of conflicts, and it's something that companies should have very strong policies about to address what kinds of gifts are acceptable and what kinds of gifts are not. Again, the goal is you don't want employees or officers or directors accepting gifts that could taint their decision making. You don't want them to accept gifts that could be perceived to be influencing their decisions. And also, in this day and age, we have to be very careful about giving gifts. You have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which, which prohibits bribery of foreign officials, and bribery can often happen in the form of gifts. And so it's important for a company to have a really well-defined policy around gift giving and gift accepting. There has to be education around it, and the board should be providing some real active oversight in that area as it does with all of the issues that are captured within the Code of Business Conduct and Ethics. You always come back to the word disclosure. Disclosure, And yes. And I guess while the policies may be different, while the amounts may be different, probably if, it, if somebody's getting anything out of this particular show, it's probably disclose. Disclose. When I, I step back, identify. We call something a, conf a conflict, and what we're worried about it because it means that we can be making decisions with blinders on. You know, the best interests of the company um, we may not be able to see because of these personal and business interests. And we know we also have blinders on at times in identifying our own conflicts. So we have to be very clear about looking at our own behavior and the things that. Um, that could impact our decision making in the form of our relationships. And then we need to be careful to disclose them. Now there are a couple of times, there's at least one time a year when you get a policy, um, you, you, you have to fill out that director and officer questionnaire. And that questionnaire is designed to try to capture some of the kinds of relationships that could give rise to conflicts. But filling out that form isn't enough. You have an active obligation all year long should something arise to bring it to the board's attention. And certainly if the board has a decision that it's facing and you have a personal or business interest that relates to it, you have to fully tell the board about your interests in order to protect that board decision from challenge. You know, it sounds easy. It's you not. Know, it's I don't not. think it's easy. I, I can remember when I served on a public board, you know, you're, you're just moving along, doing your thing, and, and it really takes some discipline to think through all the day-to-day -day things that either have optics or have fear of being misconstrued in the way of being a conflict, even though it was so innocent mm -hmm. at its time. Um, so that it's really become a, quite a challenge, I would expect, for directors. I think it is, and I think we have to always remember that perceptions really matter. and. Um, in this day and age with the scrutiny that directors and corporations are under and the sort of uh, the, the, um, the tendency for, for the media certainly to assume the worst, this is an area where I think directors really take care of themselves and their reputation by erring on the side of real caution. Yeah. Let's talk about the downside. Let's say even though the mm -hmm. incidents may be innocent and whatever mm -hmm. or maybe they aren't mm -hmm. innocent, um, why is this so important? What's the downside if somebody is sort of caught or a board's caught okay. 
Well, I said the big downside again is that a business decision might not be made in the interest of the company. But let's talk about how that plays out. Um, there are shareholder suits al all the time alleging a breach of duties. And when a director has an interest, a conflict of interest in a transaction, and participated in the decision making, it makes it easier for a, for a suit to withstand some of the early uh, opportunities to dispose of those lawsuits. And so it can prolong a lawsuit that shouldn't have ever been brought or, or, or you know, come into being. It can force the company to prove that its bus the actual business decision was fair to the corporation, which is a high burden of proof. And with the benefit of hindsight, transactions are usually questioned when they failed. So it's really difficult. Um, it imposes a real burden on, on the board and on the company in, those, in that kind of litigation. I think the other issue is around disclosure. There are a lot of disclosure obligations that companies have, and failing to see a conflict and disclose it could, could pose problems in that respect. And then again, conflicts can taint director independence, um, so they need to be disclosed so that the board can have a, a real good discussion around whether a, a relationship has uh, impacted independence determinations. A whole host of things. I would think another big one would be reputational risk these oh, days. Sure. That that um, we've seen boards and individuals, you know, again in fairly innocent situations, be tainted pretty well on the reputational risk side. Absolutely, I think that's the bottom line, and that to me is probably the most the most likely to be the detrimental impact. Yeah, I think that's what directors actually, <laughs> in a lot of cases, fear most. Mm -hmm. You know. And that's what also, I think, for me, brings it back to that notion of appearances. Even things that aren't true conflicts, if the outside world will view it as questionable, it's all the more reason to be very careful yeah. around it. We've got about uh, half a minute left. Give me the one or two things um, that you think that everybody should be aware of that, uh, or guidance that you would give around this area. And I, I assume, we'll automatically assume that one is disclosed. Disclose. Identify and disclose. Identify and disclose. Have clear policies, both for directors and for your rank and file, and of course for your officers. Review those policies periodically. Make sure that they address what you view as the biggest risk of conflicts, how conflicts are most likely to arise. Um, for example, if you've got um, foreign operations and gift giving in those areas, you want to make sure that the people in those areas really are having a much deeper dive in education maybe than you need to do in other parts of the company. Um, make sure, of course, that you have um, good books and records and internal controls around all of these issues. Capture the disclosures that are made. Um, and, and make sure that the board has a chance to talk about periodically and refresh on this issue. Holly Gregory, I knew this would be a topic that you could handle very well, so I want to thank you for joining us on the show this week. Thank you, TK. And that will conclude this edition of This Week in the Boardroom. We hope you'll join us next week when we'll take a look at another critical topic that will help you be a better board member or committee member. We'll see you then. again next week for This Week in the Boardroom, brought to you by Corporate Board Member and host NYSE Euronext, along with Governance Knowledge Partner, the Center for Audit Quality, and contributing partners, National Investor Relations Institute, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals.